The theme of today's webinar is on heat waves and their implications for aquatic biodiversity and human communities in British Columbia and beyond. The heat wave that occurred in the Western Canada in early this month uh, broke the temperature records in many areas, causing possibly over 600 excess heat related deaths and the mass die off of marine life along the seashore in British Columbia. In fact, I was camping in North Thompson River area during the heat waves. While I was driving to the campsite, the thermometer in my car recorded um, over 40 degrees Celsius. And it, uh, uh, in fact, at some point it was uh, 50 degrees Celsius. It actually was the highest that I have ever experienced. I grew up in the tropics and when I moved to Canada, I thought I wouldn't have to worry about um, the summer hot weather. I only have to worry about um, the cold weather in here, but apparently I, I'm wrong. And actually, Environment and Climate Change Calendar has forecast another heat wave coming this weekend. So this webinar is really timely. Recent studies shows that climate change has been increasing in intensity and frequency of heat waves, and that these heat waves are having major impacts on ecosystems and people. So what should we do to deal with these challenges that we are facing. And so in this webinar, we are bringing together leading experts in climatology, oceanography, aquatic ecology, and fisheries, uh, particularly um, our colleagues from the UBC Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries to share their knowledge about heat waves and how we should respond to that. We particularly focus on our attention on aquatic biodiversity and ecosystems and the people who are dependent on them. And we hope that this webinar will provide a forum for all of us, including you, to discuss about this important topic. Uh, the Institute for the Ocean and Fisheries, that we call ourselves IOF, um, aims to secure healthy and sustainable marine and freshwater systems through interdisciplinary research, education, and societal engagement. And we have diverse and international graduate program and postdoctoral research, as well as uh, in very vibrant research associate groups. Many of our works directly linked to and supporting policy discussions internationally and globally, and often through, often through cooperations with partners and um, different sectors, uh, stakeholders and knowledge holders. Um, so we don't only do research, but we try to connect it to policy and support policy as well. So let me explain a bit about um, the program today. We have prepared four short talks and this talk aimed to provide a brief introduction to a few different dimensions of today's topic. And after that, we have invited two colleagues to share their reflections on the talks and topics from their perspective. We will then open the floor for questions and discussions with all of you. The webinar will be moderated by Dr. Colette Webness. Colette is the lead scientist at the Center for Ocean Solutions at Stanford University as well as a research associate in our institute. Her work seeks to understand how social ecological systems respond to change and are interested in co-developing strategies to optimize resilience and that are equitable and sustainable. Our first speaker is Dr. Simon Donner. He is a professor at the Department of Geography as well as a professor at our institute at UBC. Simon is an interdisciplinary climate scientist who aims to address socially relevant questions surrounding climate change. He is currently a lead author of the IPCC 6 assessment report, and you probably have seen some of his interviews by the media on recent heat waves. He will talk about the causes behind the recent heat waves. The second speaker is Dr. Chris Harley. He is a professor at zoology and our institute uh, at UBC. He studies how by abiotic forces such as temperature and ocean acidification interact with biological relationships to structure coastal marine community. Again, you probably have seen his quotes in the news about the recent heat waves and the mass die-offs of organisms along the coast. And he will speak about this topic um, in today's webinar. Our third speaker is Dr. Brian Hunt. He's an assistant professor at, the, at our institute. Brian is an ecosystem oceanographer who study the structure and functions of pelagic marine ecosystems and their response to climate forcing and anthropogenic impacts. He has been studying the complex interlinkages between environmental drivers and our coastal oceans and footwear. 
and his talk will explain particularly about the linkages between heat waves and our coastal oceans. And finally, I will talk about how heat waves are affecting fish stocks and fisheries. As I said, uh, we've invited a couple of colleagues uh, to provide some reflections on the talks and the topics uh, to stimulate our discussion. The first discussion is Dr. Andrea Reed. She is an assistant professor and the principal investigator of the Center for Indigenous Fisheries at our institute. Our second discussion is Dr. Bob Wedgley, and he is the director of science of Oceania Calendar. We hope all of these will provide good food for thought uh, for a vibrant discussion. Without further ado, let's start the talk. The heat wave earlier this summer shattered records across Western Canada. My name is Simon Donner. I'm a professor in the geography department and the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. And I'm here to do a little crime scene analysis of the West Coast heat wave. As everyone's already heard at this point, we had what meteorologists call a heat dome, an area of high pressure locked in place that meant there was sinking air. And when air is sinking, it warms. And that led to some of the extreme heat. What made it so extreme was that the air movement in the upper atmosphere was sluggish. So the jet stream was moving slowly. It allowed the weather system to lock in place. And it happened to happen here on the West Coast because of the patterns of ocean temperatures in the Pacific and how they affect what happens in the upper atmosphere. And when you add to that the fact that we had the longest days of the year, this was late June, right? We already had pretty dry conditions. And just the orientation of the mountains and how the topography is in Western, in, in Western Canada and in British Columbia, Air was sinking along mountain valleys, and that's how we got some of those really extreme weather records like we saw in Lytton, British Columbia. Now, the question everybody asks is, was this caused by climate change? And there are kind of two ways to think about the question of, is blank caused by climate change? One is the way epidemiologists might talk about how, you know, whether cigarette smoking causes lung cancer. We can't say for sure that this is the cigarette that's going to give you lung cancer or that you're for sure going to get lung cancer from smoking, but we can look at the odds of getting lung cancer if you smoke. And so we can do the same sort of thing with climate events. And I'll give you an example from my own work. So I study how heat waves cause coral bleaching. The, the coral on the right um, in this photograph is bleached, is turned white, as a result of extreme water temperatures. And so we did a study 15 years ago of a heat wave in the Caribbean, an ocean heat wave, to see what are the odds it would happen with and without climate change. And we found that this 2005 heat wave without human influence on the atmosphere was like a one in 1,000 year event. It was extremely unlikely to happen. When you add greenhouse gases into the scenario, well, now it becomes much more common. Up to 10% of the time, this event might, might happen. And if we roll this forward into the future, keep adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, within a little bit more than a decade from now, this type of event might be happening most years. And so this type of extreme event attribution study used to take scientists a long time. It took us a year to do the analysis for that work, but the models have become better, the computers have become faster, we have more data, and now there's been attribution event studies like that all over the world. And it only took a week for scientists to do the attribution of, that, of the West Coast heat wave. And what the study that's been produced found was that this event was not more than 99% attributable to climate change. It was 150 times more likely because of the greenhouse gases that human activity has added to the atmosphere. And they also found that if the planet continues to warm and gets to two degrees of warming above pre-industrial, this event becomes 100 to 200 times more likely. So yes, it was a very extremely rare weather event, even for today's climate, but if the planet keeps warming, it's become more common. Now, you may hear that this study has yet to be peer reviewed, but the key thing to know is that the methods in it are so commonly used now that it's unlikely that the analysis that was done was, inc was incorrect. But there's another way to think about the role climate change may have played. The other way to think about it is the actual physics and mechanics of the particular weather events. And so we've had extreme events all across the Northern Hemisphere this summer, this map is showing a series of stagnant weather systems or air pressure systems across the Northern Hemisphere. And that they led to low pressure system that caused extreme rainfall in China, record-breaking rainfall in Germany, and a big heat wave in, in Ireland, right? 
So it's all part of this sluggish movement of air in the Northern Hemisphere. And it turns out that this slow movement of air and this sort of blocked wave pattern in the upper atmosphere might on its own be related to climate change. So there is pretty clear physical evidence that as the planet's warming and the higher latitudes are warming faster than the lower latitudes, you've got less of a temperature gradient and that should slow down winds in the upper atmosphere. It should slow down the jet stream and lead to sort of a resonant wave pattern that's sort of more stationary or stuck in place that could lead to these sort of blocked weather systems, right? Now, whether this is happening because of climate change, not all scientists necessarily agree. And some of that is that the data isn't strong enough quite yet. So we need more years of analysis, more years of data to come in. And also the models can't quite represent these phenomena terribly well. But what's interesting about it is it's really not that new an idea. And so here's a study from the early 1970s published in Nature, where they looked at what would happen if you removed ice from the Arctic and warm the Arctic faster than lower latitudes. And they found that you would slow down the jet stream and have more stagnant weather systems. And so while the Arctic probably did not play a role in this heat wave we just experienced, it's too early in the year for sea ice melt that probably uh, affected the heat wave. The idea that the poles are warming faster than low latitudes and the slowing of the jet stream may show a particularly unique fingerprint of climate change in the weather event we just experienced. And so you're going to hear from other people, people, other people this morning. I want before I close, though, I do want to say that I am, uh, in addition to my work here as a professor at UBC, I'm also the director of the Ocean Leaders Program. And one of the things we do every year is we teach a course called Grand Challenges in Ocean Leadership, in which students, graduate students, work in groups on sort of community problems. And so we're looking to hoping to develop some research to action projects about the, the heat wave. What, what do community groups need? What do different stakeholders need? What are you interested in about this? And so we're looking to develop some community projects out of this for this year and I'll be around as will Jill Dwyer, the program coordinator for Ocean Leaders to answer questions uh, during the Q&A. Thanks everyone. I'm a marine ecologist and I've been studying the effects of climate change on the shorelines of BC and beyond for 25 years. And when I saw the forecast for the heat wave, I was very curious if it would have an impact. I was not at all prepared for how extensive that impact would be. It was so bad you could smell it. So, it was an unprecedented event. You may have seen maps like this that just show how far above average temperatures were in British Columbia and Washington. Uh, and those air temperatures were, you know, tragic and had many effects on, you know, the town of Lytton in particular, but on cherry growers and on wildfires and, and everything else. But shorelines were also impacted. And here is a photo of, of a shore in West Vancouver in Lighthouse Park on the hottest day of the heat wave. And it doesn't look so bad when you look at it this way, but we also had a thermal imaging camera with us and you can see how hot those rocks actually are. So that scale bar on the right goes from the coolest part of the image at 18 degrees to the warmest part at a 52. I had not measured a temperature in British Columbia uh, above the mid to high 40s uh, in the intertidal before. And the muscle bed got even hotter than that. 56.7 in the muscle bed is ridiculous. I never would have anticipated we would see a temperature that high. Um, incidentally, the most tolerant animals can only live up to about 46 or 48 degrees. So temperatures in the 50s are really lethal. And a lot of things died because we had that really hot weather at the same time that we had really low tides. So we had sea stars that got caught out and died and crabs and clams and snails and sand dollars and fish and all kinds of things. The list really just goes on and on. But the species that were impacted the worst were some of the ones that are attached directly to the rock and can't move. So they couldn't go hide anywhere. And that includes seaweeds like the rockweed on the left, uh, which is uh, just baked in this photo, the mussels in the center, uh, which are sitting open, like you get them in a bowl in, in a restaurant the, and when they've been cooked. The, the, it's not a good sign when you see them looking like this on the shore when they're supposed to be closed. 
And on the right, those barnacles are literal empty shells of their former cells because even though they can tolerate some pretty incredibly high temperatures, it was just too hot. So how many animals do we think die? Well, in my hand here, I have 100 dead barnacles. So that should give you an inclination or an indication that the total number may be huge because you can fit a lot of barnacles and mussels into a small area. So if we do some simple math, based on surveys we've done in, in uh, the places we've visited so far, you might have more than 100 dead barnacles in a plot about this size, 10 by 10 centimeters. And if you scale that up to the number of those plots, you could fit into a kilometer of shoreline, and then how many kilometers of shore are in the Strait of Georgia, and you know make a, a correction for how many of those might be good barnacle habitat, you end up with incredibly high numbers, billions of barnacles died in three days. And that's just the barnacles. So the total number of dead animals, once you start including the mussels and everything else, uh, is going to be extraordinary and in my experience, unprecedented. But not everything died. Um, the, some of the species shown here had either limited mortality or no mortality, uh, or in some cases are more abundant a few weeks after the heat wave than they were a few weeks before the heat wave. What do they all have in common? None of them are native to British Columbia. Almost all of these are from Asia, places like Southern Japan or Hong Kong, where it is hotter than it is in British Columbia. And so they have that evolutionary history to cope with these high temperatures. So these may be some of the winners in the long term. Okay, what are the ripple effects going to be through the coastal ecosystem? We really don't know. We were not prepared for this kind of event. So we hadn't even started asking questions like what happens when you lose, you know, the majority of the mussels or acres of, of rockweed. But here are some things that we're worried about, right? The surf scoter, the bird on the upper left, eats mussels when it overwinters in house sound. Uh, will it have enough to eat this winter? We don't know. Uh, lots of things live in habitats created by mussels and rockweeds. What happened to those and how long will it take them to recover? We don't know. Juvenile salmon use some of that stuff as they migrate out uh, from streams towards the ocean uh, as cover. Will they be impacted? We don't know. Uh, mussels filter the water. Is there going to be an impact on water quality? Maybe, but we don't know. And what are the long-term prospects for the BC coast? And here we have some guesses. Things like mussels may recover in a year or two because they turn over so quickly, but some things like clams live for a long time and other things like the rockweed, it doesn't disperse very far, so you can't recover an area very quickly. Uh, so those species may take longer. And then there's a whole host of species we just don't know enough about their biology to even say. But what I can say with some confidence is that we will see these types of heat waves more frequently and they will become more severe. And as a consequence of that, some of the species we have in BC now will not be able to handle conditions any longer, and we will begin to see them replaced with species from other parts of the world that are warmer. So the next few decades or even the next few years could be very interesting for those of us who love to tide pool on the BC coast. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Hunt. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries, and I'm a biological oceanographer. And I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the important effects of heat waves on the coastal ocean in BC. So heat waves first really came to our attention in 2014 and, and 2015. Uh, when we experienced a really extreme event that extended all the way from Oregon up to Alaska. And this event was uh, known as the blob. And uh, since then, we've seen the recurrence of atmospheric conditions that favor the formation of heat waves. And we're again experiencing a very warm summer in 2021. So what does this mean for the surface ocean? So in a normal uh, summer, we typically get uh, heating of the surface, uh, surface ocean. And this is obviously uh, exacerbated during heat wave summers. So we get a lot of heat that's trapped in the surface ocean. And the heat has the effect of increasing stratification. Um, so we get a very strong separation between the, um, the surface and the deep ocean. And this has uh, important repercussions for the, uh, the phytoplankton that form the base of the food waves on our coast. 
So phytoplankton are you know, dependent on nutrients that are supplied to the surface where the sunlight is, that's where they need to be to grow. And so when we have very strong stratification, <clears throat> the resupply of nutrients to the surface is, is limited. And so phytoplankton production can be greatly uh, inhibited. Um, once the summer is gone and we move into fall and winter, we start getting uh, stormy weather and the storms uh, mix the surface water down into the deep, uh, the deep ocean. And this has the effect of transporting, transferring all of that heat that's been trapped in the surface during our hot summer down into the deep waters. And that heat can be trapped there for a year or more and can therefore have uh, very uh, serious implications for the organisms that are living in deeper waters, for instance, in the Strait of Georgia or in some of the fjords on our coast. One of the very important things we have to keep in mind uh, on the BC coast is the, is the very strong connection between land and sea. And so heat wave effects on the atmosphere and the land have implications for the ocean too. Um, two of the important ways in which um, uh, the land is connected to the ocean is through freshwater runoff and uh, which influences circulation and stratification and nutrient runoff. So the nutrients that are transported by this water that has implications for the productivity, the communities that can occur there, and then also organism health. So how do heat waves affect these critical processes? Um, well, one of them is through melting of glaciers and, uh, and snow caps. And so during heat wave summers, we can get intensification of melting. We can also get earlier melting happening, affecting the timing of freshwater delivery and nutrient delivery to the coastal ocean. We can also get lower summer discharge. Um, so we have low precipitation, essentially moving into drought conditions, and again, affecting the freshwater and nutrient delivery to the coastal ocean. Something that has been shown to uh, be happening with the, the warming conditions is the increased occurrence of landslides. Landslides have the effect of delivering huge amounts of material down into watersheds, and this material is then uh, transported uh, into the coastal ocean, again affecting the, the nutrient conditions in, in, in the coastal waters. And then finally, something that uh, all of us living in uh, BC in the last few years have experienced is and that is fire. So um, the fire um, releasing huge volumes of smoke, which is then transported out over the coastal ocean and, and out into the open ocean Pacific. And this smoke, uh, the particulates in the smoke will finally reach the sea surface and there affect the water chemistry and again, impact the organisms that, that live in these uh, surface ocean environments. So let's summarize the, uh, the, the, the uh, important ocean ecosystem responses. So the first of these is through heat stress. So indigenous organisms adapted to uh, conditions on the coast will be under serious or uh, well, negative, negative stress when they are uh, in these warm conditions. Um, whereas uh, new species have been shown to be increasing on the coast. So these are organisms that are coming up uh, from as far south as California, such as the pyrosomes pictured, uh, pictured here. Have, they have been really increasing in abundance in the, in the uh, oceanic waters of British Columbia in recent years. Nutrient stress is very important. As I've said, it can impact uh, phytoplankton production. So we'll experience decreased production with uh, increased uh, stratification, decreased nutrient supply to the surface ocean. And then shifts in the, the nutrient uh, balance because of the changes in delivery from land, uh, from, for example, through fire, can increase the occurrence of harmful algal blooms. Uh, nutrient dynamics are also very important for organism nutrition and particularly uh, production of essential fatty acids. And uh, the nutrient stress can lead to uh, declines in organism health. And this then has implications for human health too, for those of us uh, who are dependent on marine sources for sustenance. Um, and then finally, I'll touch on life cycle stress. Uh, one of the effects of uh, heat wave events is shifting the timing of key environmental events in the coast, for example, the spring bloom timing or the fresh air timing. And these can impact uh, uh, life, particular life stages of, of key species on the coast, such as Pacific herring, which have um, life cycles that are very keyed into these events, um, the timing of these events. So if you get a mismatch, you can get uh, pro recruitment um, success for species such as herring. I'm going to leave it at that and uh, I'll uh, look forward to the discussion and if there are topics that are not covered in the discussion that you'd like to follow up on, please, please feel free to contact me.
Thank you, Brian, for providing an excellent explanation of the relationship between heat waves and our coastal ocean. I will follow up his talk by talking about the impacts of heat waves on fish stocks and fisheries. <clears throat> there are widespread concerns that the heat waves that we are experiencing now, both on land and in the ocean, are already affecting aquatic ecosystems and the species therein. Particularly, we are already seeing organisms that are important to us being impacted by these heat waves. Fishes and invertebrates are ectotherms, meaning that their body temperature is dependent on environmental temperature. Their biological performance is optimal at a certain range of temperature that varies between species. And when temperature increases beyond that optimal, the organism's body performance will decrease. And when temperature increases above a certain critical threshold, many of them will die. Our research group has been putting together the available data and information that will allow us to estimate species performance, preferences to temperature, the threshold, and responses to other environmental change, such as changing oxygen level and salinity in the ocean. We particularly focus on species that are important to fisheries. We combine these data sets with the current and projected future environmental conditions. These future conditions include ocean temperature, among other ocean variables. Their changes are dependent on the assumptions of how well we mitigate climate change. We then use computer simulation models to project how our fish stocks and fisheries are expected to be impacted. What we find is that if we continue to emit carbon dioxide as we are now, temperature will continue to go up and major fish and invertebrate stocks that are important to our coastal communities will be largely impacted. For example, our works project a decrease in Pacific salmon catch potential by 30% in the next few decades. Also, the south coast of British Columbia is projected to be impacted more compared to the north. However, these projections are based on changes in climate and ocean conditions that have been averaged across decades. We also know that ocean conditions vary by year and season, and the effects of some of these shorter term events, such as heat wave, can act to the long term impacts. So we have included these short term high temperature events into our model simulation that act on top of the longer term climate change effects. Overall, our findings show that adding heat waves to longer term decadal climate change is like adding fuel to the fire. Heat waves exacerbate the impacts of climate change that we just talked about. For example, when a heat wave occurs, it increases the chance of dying of the organism, affect their reproduction, accelerate their shift in distribution, and reduce catch for some of our fisheries important species. For example, in the case of sockeye salmon, we projected a doubling of decreases in potential catches when we add climate impacts to heat wave events. So as sockeye salmon is projected to decrease by 30% under climate change, the decrease will now become 60% if we add the occurrence of heat waves. It would also multiply the impacts on coastal communities who are dependent on salmon, as well as other affected fish stocks for their job, for their food, and for their income. So what should we do in response to this? From the policy perspectives, it is important to limit climate change and global warming. Canada is a signatory of the Paris Agreement through which we have the obligations to take actions to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial level. If that's successful, some of the worst impacts of heat waves can be avoided. In addition, there are some adaptation options that we can do to help alleviate the problem of heat waves impacts on fish stocks and fisheries. These include conserving and restoring coastal vegetations and habitats, such as cap forests, ensuring that fish stocks are healthy, 
to increase their chance of adapting to some of the impacts from heat waves and climate change. It is also useful to be proactive in designing conservation and fisheries management that incorporate the effects of climate change and heat waves in it. These are the kind of things that, for example, the BC climate preparedness and adaptation strategies can include. At the individual level, we can support governments and policies that promote climate actions and sustainable fisheries management. Also, be ocean literate. Our institute and our partners and colleagues, such as OceanWise, Oceana, we offer a lot of useful information that can keep you informed about the latest knowledge and opportunities to take action. So follow our social media and website. Thank you very much. I invite um, Dr. Andrea Reed and then Dr. Bob Langley uh, to provide um, their reflections on the presentations that we have seen. So the floor is yours, Andrea. Thanks very much, Colette, and thanks everyone for, for sharing um, that information on, on the impacts of, of the recent heat wave. Um, I just yeah wanted to take this opportunity to share a few words to connect many of the realities that, that Simon, Chris, Brian, and, and William shared for Indigenous peoples here in BC and around the world. So first, I'd like to reiterate, as I often do, that I don't represent all Indigenous peoples and can't speak on behalf of communities and contexts outside of my own limited experience, but as an Indigenous scholar, I can speak to what I've learned, observed, experienced, and researched with respect to Indigenous fisheries. So as these talks made clear, the ecological consequences of increasing climate uncertainty and extremes such as heat waves like the one we just experienced are profound, and William demonstrated some clear connections for what this means for fisheries and for people, for food systems and livelihoods in particular. And I'd like to extend that by one step further and make the connection also to, to cultural and social implications, especially for Indigenous peoples who often live without separation from the quote unquote natural world. Many Indigenous languages in so-called British Columbia don't have a word for nature for that very reason, that people are understood, are understood as part of and not something separate from um, the systems that we inhabit and interact with. Evidence from around the world shows that Indigenous peoples bear a disproportionate burden uh, from climate change impacts and associated extreme events, yet often have contributed very little to the many drivers of global climate change. And when we look at this BC context and this recent heat wave, the impacts are manifold, as was made clear, um, and many have direct and often interacting effects for, for our oceans, fresh waters, and associated fisheries. This is a place where Indigenous peoples up and down the coast and all the way into the interior identify as salmon people. And salmon, as many of us know, are, are cold water animals. And they're getting dangerously close to, to meeting their thermal limits um, as heat waves like this cause quick rises in, in water temperature across our rivers and spawning creeks and streams. And William showed what that might do to, to stocks and their availability. I just wanted to take a moment, if I could, to quickly share my screen if that is enabled yes it is one second um, just to share with you some of the recent data uh, collected by David Patterson's environmental watch group at, at DFO um, this is from the hope monitoring station on the Fraser River on the x-axis you can see uh, the dates with the, the end of June being the, the timing of the recent heat wave um, this solid line in the middle that's showing the historic mean daily water temperature at Hope from 1950 to 2020. And the red dots are the 2021 observed temperatures uh, of each day. And you can see that right at the end of June, we see this uptick in temperatures where we're nearing 18 degrees Celsius in the water, where we see in salmon, that's a tipping point for decreased swim performance. And since then, as Brian made clear, some of these rises in temperatures can be sustained. And after that event, we see just a continuous 
tick upwards to 19 degrees Celsius in the water, where we see early signs of physiological stress and slowed migration in salmon. Um, and the prediction moving forward is that we're going to, to go above 20 degrees Celsius, nearing 21 degrees Celsius. So there we see high pre-spawn mortality and disease, um, severe stress and, and early mortality in salmon. So I think we need to begin thinking critically about what this all means for, for salmon people. Um, one thing I wanted to also just speak to today is that and one area that we can maybe find a little bit of, of hope in, in all of this kind of devastating news um, is the recent decision that uh, was made for the Blueberry First Nations. And I'm just gonna drop a link here in the chat to a recent Narwhal article uh, describing this. Um, but for this group, we see a precedent setting treaty rights case. And this is the first time that a court in Canada has recognized cumulative effects um, across a territory as an infringement of rights, rather than only looking at infringements from say a specific project. And I think that this is really where a lot of nations are, are putting a lot of their, their time and energy and thinking now, um, because none of these things are, are operating in a vacuum. And I think the time has really come for us as scientists to move beyond you know, more myopic approaches to looking at only one stressor and its response when we're, we're really living in a world where there are multiple stressors that are coming together and really impacting uh, our, our ecosystems, our, our fisheries, people and, and places that we inhabit. So I'll leave it at that for now. But thanks so much, everyone. And I'll, I'll pass it over to back to Colette, I suppose. Many thanks, Andrea, for, for your insights. Um, and yes, I'll pass the mic microphone over to Bob. Well, well hi, everyone. Uh, well, so thank you very much for those talks. I, I have to say they're somewhat frightening. Um, I'm sitting here in Halifax and been watching things on the Pacific coast uh, from quite a distance and haven't felt like many of you uh, firsthand uh, effects of this, uh, this current heat wave. Um, what, what really strikes me um, is I think, you know, there's two things. I'm, I'm quite interested in the, the conservation action and what we're going, what needs to be done around um, adaptation and response. Uh, William touched on some of that. And what strikes me most importantly is the sort of the, still the lack of urgency in our policy responses. And I, th I think it's really clear and you've made it abundantly clear in these talks that, um, that the, um, you know, this is climate change is no longer a sort of a, a disaster in slow motion. This is happening really rapidly. And as William pointed out, and I think it's sort of a great way to, you know, adding fuel to the, to the, the climate change uh, sort of fire, these, these heat waves. Um, you know, we heard, we heard that we're gonna see more of them. Uh, we heard that, um, you know, there's sort of profound uh, trophic and displacement effects of species and how that in fact impacts our fisheries. Um, invasive species uh, are going to apparently uh, dominate by the looks of things and strong sort of nutritional and coastal communities impacts. So I, I guess I'd ask the question, you know, what are we going to do in terms of uh, uh, oceans and coastal um, adaptation strategy and particularly around fisheries. Uh, Oceana Canada, we, we do a annual fishery audit and uh, performance around our fisheries policies are, 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 are lacking, let's say. Um, are, are this, you know, we can only identify about 30% of our, less than 30%, about a quarter of our stocks can be verified as healthy. Uh, we have a real implementation gap on policy in Canada, we don't have a climate change uh, strategy for fisheries, so we haven't even started that uh, effectively. And, um, and so when it comes to fisheries and some of the other conservation tools, I guess I would ask, um, what are those resiliency building um, conservation approaches we need to take? Uh, clearly rebuilding our stocks has to be a priority um, that helps the, the fisheries and the, the stocks themselves of course build more resiliency and uh, certainly the value for biodiversity and some of our protected areas approaches um, 
so I guess uh, maybe I'll just just leave it with that. Um, I'm, I'm quite concerned about the, the our, you know, our, our, our federal government response around our fisheries and that we're, we're really not climate climate ready for um, adaptation to these things. So how are we going to bring the uncertainty, not only with respect to some known factors around climate change, but this, this um, you know, the, these pulses of heat waves and uh, extreme events that uh, we're hearing are going to, um, you know, accelerate those, those impacts. Um, we don't deal with uncertainty well in our fisheries and oceans management. We tend to kind of look in the rear view mirror in terms of how we expect stocks to respond to conditions. But, um, you know, as has been well pointed out, we need to look at these cumulative effects. And um, I think we need to certainly strengthen our, our policies, um, but more importantly, create the um, sense of urgency, which I think you've done extremely well here today to accelerate our responses and to really move on the implementation of both existing policies and creating new um, approaches to climate change adaptation.